I'm here with a special guest. We are here for a digital learning network with the uh, Galena Park School District. And I know we are talking with sixth to eighth grade students who are, the theme of their studies is space camp. So I'm here with a guest who goes to space camp. Astronaut Scott Kelly has been to space three times. He flew once aboard the space shuttle on STS-103. Then he flew a second time as the commander of the space shuttle during STS-118. And most recently, he flew aboard the International Space Station as the commander of Expedition 26. And he uh, was there for 159 days. Welcome, Scott. Thank you for coming. Oh, it's great to be here, Amigo. Thank you. All right, and uh, we're ready to go ahead and go with your questions. So, kids? So here we have Jacob. Jacob, go ahead. Um, what would have happened if the Soyuz or the space shuttle had an engine failure or a problem? And if y'all weren't docked to the space station? For the uh, the space shuttle, um, the space shuttle has various ways of, of uh, compensating if an engine fails. If it was to fail on the launch pad um, after liftoff, certainly before liftoff, the, the shuttle wouldn't uh, actually lift off the pad, but if it was after liftoff in the first part of the ascent, you would come back to the uh, Kennedy Space Center and land. As you get uh, faster and higher, your options to abort um, improve um, to where the next the next option would be potentially landing in a uh, at a landing site in Africa. And uh, later on in the eight and a half minute ascent, you could actually do what's called an abort to orbit where you might get in a, into a lower orbit, uh, not the one that you intended to go into, but something that is safe. Um, for the Soyuz, uh, again, it depends on where that engine failure happens, uh, where in the, in the launch trajectory it happens. Um, in the most severe case, the Soyuz has an escape system that'll basically rocket the capsule away from the, the larger rocket and uh, allow the crew to land under the parachute. Of course, you know, as you get, just like the space shuttle, as you get faster and higher, you have uh, better options. Um, and in some cases, if the engine fails very late in the, in the ascent, you don't have to uh, really do anything at all. You have enough uh, capability in the remaining engines to get to where you need to go. Um. All righty, that's a wonderful answer. Thank you, uh, Scott Kelly. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go to the next question. Galena Park ISD, if you can just make sure you can speak as loudly and clearly into the microphone as you can, we'd appreciate it. Uh, okay, um, my name is Daniel, and uh, um, how, was it, how was it like during the launches? Like, how'd you feel? You know, it's interesting. On my, on my first flight on the, uh, the space shuttle, um, the space shuttle uh, on the launch pad weighs uh, about five million pounds and has about seven and a half million pounds of thrust that uh, launches it into space. And uh, on the first, your first flight into space, it really uh, gets your attention. Um, it feels like you feel every pound of that seven and a half million pounds of thrust. You you get the sense that. You're going somewhere. Uh, you're not sure where. You know you're going there in a hurry, and you know you're not coming back to Florida. I mean, it just it just leaps off the launch pad. Uh, the Soyuz is a little bit different um, for for a number of reasons. It doesn't have the same amount of thrust, although it does have a uh, higher acceleration. So you feel higher G forces later in the uh, in the ascent. And then the other difference with the Soyuz is that um, when the second and third stages of the, the Soyuz light, when the engines light, they do it, um, you know, after the previous stage has, has, has shut down. So, um, at least in the case of the second and the third stage. So you feel like you're accelerating and then you stop accelerating and you kind of go to like a zero G kind of feeling and then the engines kick on and it's really like a real kick in the pants, uh, so to speak, that it starts accelerating you out again. So there is some differences. Um, you know, it's very exciting uh, time, certainly, and, um, and uh, certainly a lot of fun, too. Very good question. And also, there's some significant differences in the landing of those two vehicles as well. You want to quickly discuss Yeah, well, the, uh, the landing of the Soyuz and the, and the 
and the shuttle are, are much different. The shuttle lands uh, kind of like an airplane. It uh, is much more gentle, and it's because it was designed to be a reusable vehicle that you know brought potentially sensitive uh, scientific experiments and other uh, and other sensitive equipment home. Not to mention the vehicle is somewhat sensitive because we needed to reuse it. So the uh, the Soyuz is much different. The Soyuz uh, enters as a capsule. It uh, lands under a parachute and lands uh, and, and lands in the uh, in the desert. Um, the shuttle landing is is much more gentle. It's actually flown by the commander. Uh, the Soyuz is uh, generally speaking all automatic and is more like uh, whereas the shuttle's like an airplane. The Soyuz is more like going over Niagara Falls in a barrel. It's uh, it's a very very uh, dynamic. We call it dynamic ride and very exciting. Next question. I wanted to know how long does it take to get into to get out of the atmosphere and get into space. Well, you know, space is uh, is defined as this like 50 mile barrier, and um, it takes several minutes to get get to that altitude, both in the in the space shuttle and in the Soyuz. It doesn't actually feel like you're in space until the engines um, of, of those vehicles cut off. Uh, and that's when you go from this uh, acceleration, uh, getting you to a very fast speed to where you actually feel zero gravity. Um, and that takes, on the shuttle, eight and a half minutes, on the Soyuz, a little over nine minutes before it's, uh, before you're, you know, not only are you in space, but you feel like you're in space because you're then floating. And we're looking at now, that was just a video clip of a Soyuz launch. Next question. Um, do you ever get used to the feeling of going into space and landing from coming back? You know, having flown uh, three times, I would say uh, I haven't gotten used to it. Um, you know, there are aspects of it that, that get more comfortable. Um, you know, I flew twice on the Soyuz and one, or twice on the shuttle and once on the Soyuz. So, um, you know, it's only only one of those vehicles did I fly on twice. Um, but I think it would take me uh, many many flights before I got completely comfortable with uh, either the launch or the landing of either the the shuttle or the the Soyuz. So I don't think he's done. I'd like to have the opportunity to get very comfortable. <laughs> Next question. What do you like about being in NASA? Can you repeat the question one more time? Uh, what do you like being? Um, what do you like about being an astronaut? What do I like about being an astronaut? Well, certainly, you know, flying in space is a is a great um, part of the job. But to me, um, the best part about being an astronaut is that. Uh, flying in space is very, very challenging. It's uh, it's very difficult, and um, there's a lot of satisfaction to be ha had by being a part of something that is very, very challenging, very hard, working hard at it, working with a, a team, and then uh, being successful and and proud of your success. So, you know, it's not the individual, you know, f launching in space or landing or looking at the earth or floating. It's it's being a part of something that's much larger than yourself, something that you consider important, something that you work um, with a team, and then, uh, you know, you're proud of your success. And when I go around the country and talk about the space program and, and talk to kids, what I say is that same type of satisfaction and challenge that you know, we experience in the space program. Uh, you can also experience in your own lives, whether it's uh, with your schoolwork, you know, if, if it's, uh, you know, if you find something that's difficult and you work hard at it, then you can be proud of your success. And you can do that, you know, in, with your schoolwork and sports and other careers that you may decide to pursue. Um, you know, I encourage you to pursue something that's challenging, something that's um, you know, not necessarily easy for you, you know, challenge yourself 
uh, with your schoolwork, with uh, what you decide to do in your life, and then be proud of yourselves when you're successful. Hi, my name is Miracle. I'd like to know what type of training do you have to go through to be an astronaut? It's, uh, you know, to become an astronaut, uh, NASA looks for people that certainly have the appropriate technical background in science or math or engineering, some technical field, but also, you know, people that have proven themselves in whatever uh, job they're currently in. In my case, I was a, a military uh, test pilot um, prior to becoming an astronaut. The, uh, the selection process is, is pretty... Um, uh, it's pretty selective because there's only so many people here and a lot of people that, that want the job. But I wouldn't discourage anyone from, from uh, pursuing this as a, as a career just because, uh, you know, there aren't a whole lot of opportunities right now because obviously, you know, somebody has to, has to do it. And, uh, you know, people that, um, you know, are very motivated and work hard uh, a lot of times have this kind of opportunity. So I wouldn't be discouraging um uh, to anyone that that wanted to do this, just because there's there's only uh, you know limited opportunities at this point, you never know what what might be in the future. Uh, once you become an astronaut, the 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 training is pretty extensive, and um, you know I've been here for 16 years, and I still sometimes say to my uh, my daughters that I have a class, and my eight year old looks at me and she's like, you know, why do you have a class, Dad? You're old. You shouldn't be having a class. But, you know, as an astronaut, you train, you know, not every day, but all the time. And some of that training is uh, academic training. Some of it's studying on your own. Some of it's doing, you know, robotic operations or training for launch and landing in a simulator or training in a pool in a big bulky spacesuit for a spacewalk. So, um, you know, I, I feel like I've been going to school continuously since kindergarten and uh, you know that's uh, over 40 years so um, I guess the message there is that you know if you want to be successful in life and you want to uh, you know have a career that challenges you you never you never stop learning you always need to consider yourself a student of something and that's the way you uh, you know continue to improve and um, and uh, increases your chances of being successful in life that's also a very a very good message that you talk about not to just be discouraged because of the opportunity but also be um, you know look at your background I mean you were a son of two police officers and uh, you know becoming an astronaut wasn't necessarily you know something that was right there laid out in the stars I mean you actually had to work for that yeah I came from a uh, uh, a blue-collar family um, you know, essentially, my brother and I were the first uh, generations in our in our in our family to go to college, and uh, you know, being a uh, you know an officer in the military and a pilot was not something that people really did from uh, you know where I was from at that time. So, it uh, you know it was it was basically you know my brother and I uh, becoming astronauts. You know, we basically had the same opportunity as. Uh, many kids out there, um, which basically I think what I'm trying to say is we didn't have any extra special uh, help to do this because of, you know, the background that we came from. Exactly. So bottom line is it's up to you. Good question. And next one. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kennedy. I'd like to know, when you're in space, are you ever afraid of what you might discover there? Um, you know, I, I think people that are astronauts are, are explorers in, at heart, and um, they're looking for discoveries and, uh, you know, not really afraid of what they might find. Um, you know, as far as, like, big surprises, if you're referring to things that might you know, you might have seen on a science fiction movie or something or that that kind of stuff that might scare you. Um, now, we actually don't really think about that in space. Certainly, certainly there are some things that worry you and uh, might be a little bit scary. Most, most astronauts are more scared about uh, making mistakes 
than they are about their you know physical well-being on the on the rocket uh, you know most of the the times um, in space that are the riskiest riskiest um, are the are the times where you're most focused on what you're doing so you really don't have time to be scared you're you're uh, you know focused on your job and uh, completing that and not really worrying about what could happen if things go bad well, thank you who inspired you to become an astronaut and a pilot or were you following your brother's path you know um, my brother and I were both in the same uh, astronaut class and although he was in the Navy a year before me it was really my idea to join the Navy and be a pilot and he kind of stole that from me um, as far as as far as inspiration I just thought that uh, I do remember reading the book, The Right Stuff, it, it's called. It's about the early uh, test pilots in the uh, in the jet age when we first broke the uh, speed of sound and about the early astronauts. And I remember reading that book, and uh, while I was reading it, I'm thinking, you know, I think I can do this. You know, this seems really exciting, but, you know, I didn't see anything in that book that made those pilots or those astronauts really, you know, stand out above what I thought I had the capability to achieve. Maybe I was being naive at the time, but, but uh, you know, I was certainly a dreamer like a lot of kids, and I thought, hey, I could probably do this. And I thought it would be really fun uh, to be a, a, a pilot of a high-performance jet airplane. And I thought to myself, um, you know, what would be the most challenging type of flying? And I, you know, figured it would be landing on an aircraft carrier, um, especially at night. So I decided to uh, be a Navy uh, Navy pilot. Thanks. Next question. Hi, my name is Ariana. I would like to know um, how you felt when you were landing. How I felt when I was where? Landing. Back to Earth. Um, on my last landing in the uh, in the space shuttle, I was actually flying it. Um, so, like I said before, I was really focused on on doing my job. You feel a little bit dizzy. Um, uh, you you haven't been exposed to gravity for in that, in that case 13 days. So um, your what's called the vestibular system, your balance system, is not um, normal. It's not how it how it is on Earth. Um, because it uses gravity to, to uh, you know, know which way is up and down and to, to stabilize yourself. So when you're coming back into gravity, you're dizzy. And in this case, I'm trying to fly the, the space shuttle. So it's somewhat uh, challenging. Certainly uh, very exciting because you're at the end of this very, you know, challenging and exciting and uh, time in your life. And... Um, the Soyuz, though, is different. It's much more uh, dynamic. Uh, when the drogue chute opens, it has several parachutes. One of them is called the drogue chute that stabilizes the uh, the vehicle and, and pulls out the main chute. And when that opens, it's kind of like a uh, the wildest roller coaster you could ever imagine. It really, um, you know, the, the Soyuz really moves around and feels, probably feels a lot worse than it really is because of your, like I said, your balance system is somewhat messed up. So it really tumbles, and uh, for it feels like it's you know more than a minute. Uh, as you can see on the TV here, they show the drogue chute, and this is the main chute, the main parachute opening. Once the main parachute opens, it gets pretty stable, but then when it hits the ground, it's like uh, again like kind of like a car crash. Uh, if you could imagine like a race car driver when they actually flip the car and it's kind of tumbling through the air down the track actually feels a lot like uh, what I would imagine that to feel like. Exhilarating. Do we have any more questions? Thank you. My name is Dean, and what I want to know is, are astronauts affected by deep vein thrombosis, otherwise known as blood clots, since they aren't mo using their muscles too often? Yeah, that uh, so the the deep 
vein thrombosis that I think you, you, you hear about people experience, <coughs> excuse me, experiencing. Um, you know, sometimes people on airplanes, like I guess there's anecdotal information that's sitting for long periods of time could cause those type of blood clots. Um, you know, I don't think there's uh, any history of us having, certainly not any history of us having anything like that in space. But um, in some ways, I, I, and I'm just kind of guessing here, you might be less susceptible to that kind of thing in space because um, in space, the uh, you know, you don't have gravity pushing all the blood down from your upper body into your lower body. And I think that kind of phenomenon is uh, potentially due to, like, if you're sitting a long time, you have, uh, you know, and you're not moving around, potentially the blood in your in your lower extremities are kind of, uh, you know, a little bit more stagnant than they might otherwise would be. So in space where everything floats, your the blood in your body is distributed, um, you know, perfectly evenly and is not... Um, you know, affected by gravity. So I think there's probably less of a chance to have something like that um, in in uh, in orbit or in space. All right. Thank you for that answer, Scott Kelly. We are going to do one more question from Galena Park ISD and then wrap up from there. So one more question. Speak loud and clearly in the microphone, and uh, we'll go from there. Good morning. My name is Jocelyn, and I wanted to know when you finally reach outer space and you're able to gaze at the, the magnificent Earth in person, that must be so surreal, and how does that make you feel? You know, I can, you know, on my last flight, I had six months of looking at the Earth, and uh, it's very beautiful. Um, have certain memories of, of, of certain uh, parts of the Earth. Um, <clears throat> My, on my first flight on STS-103, I can rem we launched at night, and I can remember um, turning to the commander of the space shuttle and uh, asking him what uh, – I said something. I forget exactly how I put it, but I was like, what is that? You know, it was just so amazing looking, and basically – it was the sunrise and then the earth, and it was just this brilliant blue color, like the bluest thing I've ever seen in my life, perfectly clear. Um, the, uh, you know, just the clarity of it was, was impressive. Uh, you know, just absolutely breathtaking. And then, um, you know, it's interesting, the places on earth that are the most beautiful are the places that are kind of the least uh, habitable. Uh, you know, the water, um, you know, most of the planet is water. I'm, it's kind of surprising that we decided to call it planet Earth and we didn't call it planet water. But anyway, so the, you know, water is very beautiful in certain areas and uh, as well as the deserts are incredibly beautiful. That's a wrap. Good questions, guys. And uh, you heard it here. Dream big, challenge yourself, succeed. It's up to you.